The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever, the show that looks at the intersection of mental health and work, and how we can all do both better. I literally, I, I couldn't sit still. I couldn't not move all of my limbs. My heart was racing. My stomach was churning. My mind was going a bazillion miles an hour. And I still had 30 minutes to kill before I went on stage. This is really the predominant feeling that I have felt in the past year doing over 50 events for The Anxious Achiever, the book, which is about to turn one. And I was thinking about everything I've learned this year, and I wanted to bring you back this fabulous episode with Dr. Wendy Suzuki, who wrote a book called Good Anxiety, Harnessing the Power of the Most Misunderstood Emotion. Anxiety rarely feels good. And when I think about how this past year has pushed me, it actually felt really bad (laughs) a lot of the time. But it was that activation energy, right? The motivation of being on the knife edge of just enough anxiety that got me out on those stages and helped me, if I don't want to brag, often kill it in front of the audience. And I think we can all relate to that feeling. Anxiety is really hard. It's not easy, but it can be helpful and it is necessary. And so today... Dr. Wendy Suzuki, neuroscientist at New York University who studies neuroplasticity and how anxiety can be helpful in our lives and offers really useful tools to keep it on that knife edge of helpful, not harmful. Well, I want to dive right into good anxiety. I have to admit, when I saw the title of your book, I was like, I did a little happy dance. (laughs) And I love the book. But Oh, thank you. Yeah. Let's dive right in. What is good anxiety? I call anxiety good because from an evolutionary perspective, the emotion of anxiety and that underlying physiological stress response that always comes with it. It actually evolved to protect us. This is the big headline of the book, Why I Call It Good. So at its core, anxiety is protective and even critical for our survival. So you can say, okay, got that. But I'm sorry, but I don't feel protected one little tiny little bit from my anxiety. I hate it. I want to run away from my anxiety. Hate it, want to run away, want to kick it out the door. And my answer to that is that I get you. I'm there with you. And that is because we as a society, as a world, as a world society, our collective anxiety level, the volume of it is just turned way up to super max, you know, above the the highest rung because of name your favorite stressor, the news cycle, global warming, Instagram feeds, schools, whatever's stressing you out. And so, you know, too much of even a good thing is bad. And so we all have too much anxiety. It's lost its protective element. So that's why I've spent so much of this book. I wanted to make this book both science-based, but very, very practical. A big part of the book and the whole part three is learning how to worry well. What are those tools that we can all use to turn our anxiety down so we can get it back into that protective, useful zone. That is where I start. So anxiety is good because it alerts us. You say anxiety is data. Yes. How do we just practically, and and I'd like to focus this conversation for people. I mean, I I think the listeners of our show, you know, they may have been born anxious. So, So those of us who sort of travel with anxiety, I think it's really powerful for us to know how to channel our anxiety into something good. 
Yes, yes. So here are my steps from the book. Number one is let's all just agree that our collective anxiety levels are too high and let's learn how to dial that back. And so the book has a whole bunch of different approaches. Depend, Everybody's a little bit different. They like certain things. But let me start with two strongly science-based things that you can do right now to decrease that feeling of anxiety. Number one is here is the hack to activate your natural de-stressing part of your nervous system. First, did you know that every single one of us has a part of our nervous system that was designed to de-stress us? The official name is the parasympathetic nervous system, and it was designed to be equal and opposite to that fight or flight nervous system, which for some reason has a much better publicity agent than the de-stressing part of our nervous system because everybody knows about fight or flight, which increases your heart rate, increases your respiration rate, and shunts blood to your muscles. So you can either fight or run away. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm here to tell you that the parasympathetic or rest and digest part of your nervous system does the opposite. It slows down your heart rate, slows down your respiration, and shunts the blood to your digestive and reproductive organs so you can enjoy that Sunday brunch. You can enjoy a nice meal. And so how do you do that? Quickest way to do that is deep breathing. That is consciously slowing down your breathing. You cannot consciously slow down your heart rate. You cannot consciously shunt your blood to your digestion and reproductive organs, but you can consciously breathe slowly. There's a reason why monks for thousands of years have turned to deep, slow breathing Mm -hmm. as a way to bring them into meditation, which brings them into that place of calm. And here's how I recommend you do it because it's easy to do, easy to remember. It's called boxed breathing. It is a four count inhaling. It is holding at the top for four counts, exhaling for four counts, and holding it at the bottom Mm -hmm. for four counts. Four counts for everything. Um, there, there's a million different, you know, uh, variations of this. Sometimes you have to hold it for eight, and I'm always there, like, oh, this is uncomfortable. That's hard. <laughs> I, the, the four, seven, eight calms me down, but it definitely takes me a couple of rounds to get it my does. chest you don't open. Have- Yes. So you don't have to do that whole eight thing, just four, 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 four. I can tell you, I lead people in this all the time. Just leading people through it calms me down. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I can't do it because I can't, you know, talk and, and breathe at the same time at that pace. But it is easy to do for all of your listeners out there that have kids. You can practice it with your kids. You can send your kids out with this little shield of de-stressing activity when they start to get stressed. Nobody even knows you're really doing it. So it is my number one go-to. And there's a lot of science to back that this is this is a calming activity and will decrease your stress levels if you if you can do it. Mm. Uh, regularly. And I'm not talking about hours and hours of, of doing it. That's the other good thing. Just a few rounds, you will feel that calming effect of just slowing your breathing down in this kind of very measured way. It seems to me that you're of the school that there is a place where our body brain space is engaged enough, right? We're sort of alert and we feel just stressed enough to maximize our attention and our focus. This is controversial because I think some scientists will say any anxiety is just our monkey mind acting up and it's a habit and we can calm it down. But you disagree with that, it seems. I disagree with that because, you know, this activation energy that comes with anxiety, it is an activation of the brain. And just for my own, not just mine, but, you know, think about when you performed the best. And Mm. for me, it is when I was nervous. I was a little bit scared. This was a big moment. That's not to say that I haven't gone too far over and gotten 
too scared and then and then all hell breaks loose and I don't do well. <laughs> but there are many, many examples in my life and in the book because I am my own best example of anxiety and when it works and when it doesn't. So my example in the book is I was giving a big talk to a huge audience at Olympic Stadium in Moscow, Russia. Wow. And it was the biggest audience that I had actually walked out on. And not only that, I had... I was on day two. Day one was Richard Gere, the actor, and Malcolm Gladwell. No so big deal. So I'm day two. It's like, <laughs> no big deal. And not only that, because I went to go listen to Richard and Malcolm, I knew that when they walked out on the stage, they had these little fireworks that went off at the front of the stage. There were literal fireworks <laughs> going off. And so I was like, oh my God, not only am I talking to the biggest audience, there are fireworks. And I was so glad that I saw that because that would have freaked me out even more if I saw it for the very first time. And so, you know, I wanted to do really, really well. I was worried that, you know, the translation of my talk into Russian, that they, they all had little earpieces. <laughs> it's like, that wasn't going to work. They weren't going to like it. And there were these fireworks. And so I remember that feeling behind the stage. They were messing with my microphone and I was getting ready and I'm like, okay, Wendy, you are going to give a talk that is worth fireworks. <laughs> what do you have to do to make your talk worth fireworks? And I used that thought spurred by that activation energy, which was fear to give a great talk. In fact, I got applause after the line that came at minute two of my speech, which was, exercise is the most transformative thing that you can do for your brain. They started to applaud. Wow. And I'm like, oh my God, that's going really well. So <laughs> so that's, okay. So let's talk about what your brain was doing while your brain yeah. was, was channeling that good anxiety, that, that fear. What is your brain doing then to make you perform? Yeah. So, you know, there is this Dotson law of, of brain activation where if you want to perform at your max, you are not at your couch Netflix level of activity. I'm right. sorry. That just does not work. Also, you might be happy on the couch watching Netflix, but that level of, of activation that is brain and body activation will not help you perform well. You need to get that energy and that energy comes from a little bit of fear, a little bit of activation, and that can come from your own anxiety because part of what your anxiety is doing is reminding you, hey, you are in front of an audience in a foreign country at a huge venue right after the day after Malcolm Gladwell gave an amazing talk. You better step it up. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do? That is the reminder. And that's what my stomach and my anxiety tummy was telling me. And that pushes us up to the activation level that psychologists have told us will be our max. Now, the danger is we all live on this knife edge mm. because if it goes too far, then, oh my God, I forgot. What was the first line I was going to say? Uh, what, what, what comes next? Um, because we know that stress and high levels of stress hormone can literally interfere with the performance of your brain's hippocampus, critical for long-term memory. That's helping me just remember that overall outline of my talk. Mm. But, you know, how do you stay on that knife's edge and yes. stay focused? And what I say is practice. Put yourself in those situations. Know what it feels like to use that activation energy. And I've been there enough that I crave that. If I'm not nervous before a talk, it's like something's wrong. Am I taking this not seriously enough? Because I know I'm not going to have that energy. I'm not going to generate that energy. So it is being able to use that energy. In fact, call on your anxiety. Where's that fear? Where's the fear? Because I need that fear to, to motivate me. And then how do I practice living in that fear, in that activation to keep myself on that track that gives me energy, but doesn't, you know, spill over? And it is practice. And if you find that you are spilling over, do you apply breathing? Do you apply techniques to bring it back down a little bit? I mean, yeah. is it that malleable? Yeah. So, you know, everybody has their own method. So what happens to me is 
I find things that motivate me through these kinds of public speaking experiences that, that many people find very stressful. So focusing on somebody that's nodding their head, that's smiling, that I seem to be connecting with and ignoring the bored person that is texting. Hmm. And those are very valuable tools that I have just kind of noticed myself doing automatically because other people will focus on that texting person and say, oh no, <laughs> I'm losing them. Right. Or maybe you, you have lost them and maybe there's nobody that you see. And then what you have to do is imagine, imagine that talk that went so well and bring back that energy from that other experience. It, it is similar or, or, you know, uh, maybe it's a different talk that you're giving, but, but it's a similar situation where you're in front of people. These are all kind of emotional regulation approaches that you can pre-plan before your talk. So if you, you have bored person, <laughs> ignore them. You need to not focus on the bored person. You need to focus on the one that you're engaging with. Maybe it's just one person and it's the stress induced person. So I learned a trick a long time ago, which is when you're doing work in front of a camera, which is just a, a blank, you know, it's a black box. You imagine the person, the head of the person that you love talking to, that <laughs> always inspires. And I literally did it. It transformed my experience because I literally pictured his face, a colleague of mine that I always love talking to, always has great feedback, always listens beautifully well. And that is a powerful technique that anybody can use and, and substitute. Okay. Now you have to use your powers of imagination, substitute that sour face. Right. that is coming from your anxiety inducing person that you're talking to with the face of the person that is always really engaged and lovely to speak to. In your book, you tell the story of a woman you call Monica, who is very successful. Yeah. And I really identified with her because she sort of has these obsessive tendencies that lead her to worry and question a lot. But yeah. she sees that it's a, it's a business asset and that when she's under pressure. She's identifying ahead of time the pitfalls. I call this seeing around corners. And I think yes. it's a real superpower of anxious right. achievers. But yeah. you write that her, her what if list, which is just anxiety, right? Like what if this happens, is really a tool that helps her do a more effective and complex evaluation of any business proposition at hand. Yes, I'm curious how listeners you know, because because that anxiety is hard to live with every day. I mean, yeah. right before a speech, yes, I get it. But if yeah. every business meeting brings up that what if list, right. it can be very stressful. But talk about how Monica came to realize that this stress, this anxiety was actually helping her in her business. Yeah. And again, how do you manage that knife edge? Yeah, yeah. So Monica was inspired by a lawyer that I met at a dinner party. Mm. It was a birthday party while I was writing the book. And so I was telling this uh, very high powered lawyer that is writing a book about anxiety. And her first words out of her mouth was, ah, well, I'm the high paid lawyer that I am because of my anxiety. I, I've used it for years and years. And I said, oh, do tell. What, what's your <laughs> secret? So she said, you know, I've always been anxious. In fact, lawyers are paid to worry about all these possible things. Well, she right. took it to heart and yes, it weighed her down. But what she realized is that what she can do is instead of just obsessing over all the worries, she turned every single one of those worries into a to do. And so the worries were about, you know, she was defending somebody. What if the other lawyer comes with this strategy, that strategy, the other strategy? What if the judge does this, that, and that? These are all things that came up in her lawyer mind, but that are addressable. Mm. Or she could decide, okay, actually that one, it probably will not be, but, but let's order them and let's address them in order, making her check all the boxes. And I love using that example because you can see that all of those worries, having a great argument for each one of them would 
make her a, a, a wonderful lawyer. And now I ask everybody, uh, every one of your readers, uh, readers, listeners, uh, I'm an author, a book author, okay. <laughs> not a podcaster. So all of your listeners, what can they do to transform that what if list for their children's school, for their professional life, for their family life, for their love life, you know, into things that you can do to address each one of those concerns. And you start to realize, whoa, I, I would really, I would be really on top of things. If I did all of that, I would feel more in control. I would feel great. It would actually take up my time. So I didn't have time to worry about them because I was too busy taking care of them. And I love that image because it transforms for me in a second, the worry and the just the wasting of time yep. that comes with anxiety into immediate productivity. And that is my number one superpower of anxiety in terms of the understanding of it and the immediate, you know, application of it. So that's the superpower of productivity that comes from your own form of anxiety. So how do you cultivate that? I mean, I think, oh, God, that sounds so appealing. I mean, I love the idea of shifting the rumination and the restless energy yes, yes. of the what if into something good. Do you literally sit down and write? What is the process? So here's my process, because this was one that is so common for me. Mm -hmm. uh, right before I'm about to fall asleep, I Bing, you know, there's, yep. oh, what if I didn't do that? Oh, I didn't do that well enough. Oh, God, you know, they, they're not happy with this, or maybe they won't be happy with that. And so then I would be up for hours worrying about that, couldn't shut it off. And don't get me wrong, I still have that come up. But what I do now, because I've practiced it, is I tell myself the next morning, I am going to take care of each one of those. And I'm going to do something mm -hmm. about all of these. So I note them in my about to go to sleep mind. And, and it does, the more you do it, and of course you have to do it. If you, mm -hmm. if you don't do it the next day, then, then it just keeps coming up because I noted it. I did it the next day. It's like, ah, I, I have a plan. Mm -hmm. I know that's going to be done. I don't have to worry about it right now. So it is starting a new habit, starting something good and and having success at it. Did that feel good at checking things off? And I don't know about you, but I love making lists and then like checking it and like scribbling it out because that is done. And that is the satisfaction that you get when you start putting this into practice in your life. So it's changing any what if that comes up from your anxiety and being able to change it into an action. A to-do. Yeah, from a, a to what do. if to a to-do. Exactly. Interesting. For me, I would have to write it down that night. I would for if I if mm. I slept on it, I'd forget. Mm. I don't forget because these are usually things that are, you know, top of mind, that project I'm working on, mm -hmm. that thing I'm writing. So I don't forget, but even writing it down. That's also a common tool that people use. But my step is uh, one further, not just write it down, but you are going to turn those those worries into action the mm. next day. That, again, is a very satisfying part. Naming is also very important, not to say that's not important, but naming and then putting action on it because this goes back to evolution. So anxiety was evolved to help us get away from the dangers that first affected humans, you know, millions of years ago, which were usually physical dangers, big animals, things we had to get away from. So there was a physical action that came from, you know, the anxiety that came up. We're not usually, uh, you know, in those kinds of physical dangers. So actually doing the to do and doing that, you know, you get to do this action of, of checking it off or scribbling it out as I like to do. That is satisfying. That helps satisfy oh, that, makes that long lasting, that, you know, evolutionary cycle of cause and effect of anxiety. So instead of run, it's more like put it, oh, I, that makes a yeah. ton of sense. It's do it, do it now. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, 
TIAA makes you a retirement promise. A promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. A promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. So let's talk about, you, you write very movingly about changing your own mindset about money and scarcity yeah. and risk. I think this is something that a lot of people can relate to because money was a real anxiety focus for you. And and, yeah. and you wrote that, I, I realized I had the power to calm my anxiety about money and it was a game changer. Anxiety was a warning system for you when it came to beliefs about money that kind of needed to change. How did you do this? The way that I did it was to really try and step back and take a bigger look. Mm. I did it by having much more awareness and gratitude of what I have. And so the biggest way, always, even to this day, I, I still uh, deal with this, start to get you know worried and n- no need to worry. It's like, am I able to donate to a cause? Do I have it better than others that I could give to either, you know, food banks or homeless shelters? Mm-hmm. And the answer is always yes, I can. And so that ability to say, actually, I can use my own empathy to, to say, yes, this is a big problem. And actually, when I look at it from that point of view, yes, I have this amount to be able to donate or, or, you know, to, to, to give to all these different causes. And that just shifts my worry over, you know, some ridiculous thing I'm worrying about, um, that maybe I may or may not need Hmm. to say, actually, I'm doing fine. And also, you know, big failures where I did lose a big chunk of money and I was fine, but I was able to be grateful for that experience that I gave myself and to really live the idea, not just say it, that you learn much more from your failures, especially money, money related failures than you do from your money-related successes. I think you learn very little <laughs> from your money-related su- successes. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know I if I so. agree with that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess what you're doing is you're also holding the anxiety at arm's length and looking at it and asking it a hard question of, yeah, can you afford to do this? Yes. And so what is the anxiety about money really about? Yeah. For me, it was about culture. Mm. My parents were always careful about money, there was always, you know, a fear that there wouldn't be enough. And if you grow up with that, and part of that is good. I've always been frugal and I've always been extra, extra careful with, with money that I never want to get into a situation where I'm, you know, the don't have enough money, but you can take that concern and that fear too far so that you don't give yourself the option to do things that could be very powerful or or game changing for yourself because you're too afraid that maybe you know the checking account might go go down to a level that you're you're uncomfortable with. Yeah. So that's where I was. And and I realized that I wasn't doing things that you know I could uh, afford to do that yeah, maybe they were a little bit of a risk, but there would be other ways to get out of that if the worst happened. If the worst happened. Yeah. And it's funny, I have this cookbook. Mm-hmm called plenty. And I thought I have that I need book a, too. <laughs> yeah, you know, isn't it a great, great book cookbook? Adelangi. Adelangi. Love him. So I love that word. It's a great title for a cookbook, but it was my new mantra mm-hmm. for my money mantra. Because my money mantra for so many years was <gasps> oh no. <laughs> that was my mantra. And I changed that from I I first, you know, l- test the waters. What would it feel like if I changed it from, oh, no, to plenty? Mm. Look, Wendy, you have plenty. Mm. You are doing so well. You are, you know, you are fine. And so what doors are you shutting? Because you are living like you are, you know, right on the edge of of, uh, bankruptcy, which Mm -hmm. is not the case, and not at this level where you can use your money to do things that are powerful for you, powerful for your community, powerful for your life goals. And I thought, ooh, that sounds exciting. Let me try this plenty idea. And you know what? It was not only much less 
anxiety ridden because if your idea, your your baseline idea about money is, oh no, <laughs> okay, that 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 tends to spark anxiety. But if your mantra is plenty, mm. you have plenty, you're fine. In fact, you have enough. Donate. What what can you donate to? Right. Because you have plenty. That not only opens up this area of generosity that you were cutting off because you were too scared, but it opens up all sorts of possibilities in the way that you can dream and create mm. in your life. What's the neuroscience there? I mean, are you habit replacing? Or I love, first of all, the image of going from, <gasps> which I think, <laughs> God, I can relate to that too. Plenty. What's yeah. the neuroscience behind that? I love the psychology experiments on the power of mindset. Mm -hmm. And it is just the power of your belief system that changes not just how your brain is working, but how your body responds. And this is a great example because for me, for many different years, the idea of, of money and whether I had enough would activate my anxiety and my stress system. I would start to get a little bit worried thinking about money. Am I doing it right? Did I get enough on my taxes? Mm -hmm. And, and it would actually make me like a miser in my own self image in, yeah. in, in my mindset and switching to plenty. Not only was it more true to where I was, but it, it released me from this feeling of every time I thought or planned about money, having this natural stress and anxiety response to an opportunity to activation, not of my fight or flight response, but activation of my creative brain. Mm. Because what can I do with this power, which is money, which is power, that will be delicious and wonderful mm -hmm. and inspiring. The studies on mindset don't address that directly, mm -hmm. but it's the same idea that, that this power that has been studied not only shifts how you think about things, but it shifts how your body responds to things like the idea of money. And that is very, very powerful. So in that way, can anxiety foster creativity? Oh, yes. Actually, there is a whole chapter on creativity inspired by uh, my, my dear friend, Julie Burstein, who wrote a book called Spark, How Creativity Works. Mm. She was the mastermind behind Studio 360, which uh, they oh, interviewed yeah. so many, you know, wonderful artists. And she describes different kinds of creativity that so often start in fear, anger, heartache, even disability. So poets that had a lifelong dyslexia, but caused them to, uh, because of their dyslexia, they had to read 10 times slower, mm -hmm. which gave them 10 times more appreciation of the rhythm of language. And so really you start to realize, gosh, everything that's causing me anxiety, it's also an opportunity to to try and do things in a different way. Maybe this first direction isn't working. That's why I'm anxious. That's why I'm fearful. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying different things. And you read that book and you realize, wow, you know, maybe, maybe I'm the next, you know, interviewee on, on Studio 360 because boy, I have a lot of anxiety <laughs> and fear. And she talks about the tragic gap, which is that deep, dark chasm mm -hmm. between where you are right now and what you want to create as a creative in this world. It does not exist. And you have this scary, scary, you know, task of creating that out of this chasm. And, and that goes for all the anxieties that come up in our lives. How am I going to create the family that I want? How am I going to create the job, my dream job from this crappy job that mm. I have right now. And these are all opportunities to create because those barriers are really opportunities to do something different, to do something in a different way, maybe do something in a way that nobody on earth has done before. The skill is being able to get just enough distance from the anxiety to say, this is data Yes. Right. Exactly. That's the skill because a lot of us with anxiety, we just feel trapped again in yes. the what if and the fear and we can't get out of it. 
Yeah. And that's why that's exactly right. And that's why I, I spend so much of the book on tools mm. to decrease your feeling of anxiety. Now, no, I do not say I'm the promise is not get rid of anxiety right. because anxiety is that little warning system, that directional system. <laughs> but here's an opportunity to change something that, that might not be working or to do something different. So you never want to get rid of it. In fact, you can't get rid of it. Uh, don't believe anybody who says they're going to get rid of all of your anxiety. It will always be there um, because it is a warning system. But what you can learn how to do is turn that volume down. And with things like the box breathing that I talked about, mm -hmm. movement, moving your body is also a powerful way to decrease feelings of anxiety, depression, hostility. Mm -hmm. This is research that I've done in my own lab. And the reason why that's happening is that every single time you move your body, you are releasing a whole bunch of neurochemicals in your brain. Mm -hmm. I like to say that every time you move your body, it's like you're giving your brain a wonderful bubble bath of oh. neurochemicals <laughs> that include things that you've heard of, like serotonin, uh -huh. dopamine, noradrenaline, endorphins. Those are the things that are making you feel better, that are decreasing your anxiety and your depression levels. And um, it only takes a walk outside. That is why people might be thinking, oh, you know, I sometimes take a walk. Yeah, it makes me feel better. I don't know why. Maybe it's I'm lucky. No, you are giving your brain a bubble bath. <laughs> Of neurochemicals. That, that is why you are feeling good. You are feeling better. You're feeling more energized. Now, with that knowledge, can you give your brain a bubble bath strategically, perhaps right. before an anxiety provoking conversation or an anxiety provoking meeting? Get your brain ready for that, at least in the first part of that. And then you can use breathing and, and other things, redirect your attention, not to the frowny face and replace that frowny face with that, that imagined face of your best friend that is listening to you and giving you encouragement. All these different techniques described in uh, the how to worry well section. And that's that step number one. So Wendy, tell me about the brain's attention network. Yeah, yeah. So attention and focus is so important. It is really based in our prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain right behind the forehead. It's a network. It's not just one brain area. A major part, and just for uh, simplicity's sake, is it is centered in the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. This is the part of your brain that allows you to shift and focus your attention to different things that come up in your en environment. You could either do it consciously you know, if somebody says, pay attention to my finger, you can focus on the finger. But if a bright, shiny object pops up, that will automatically attract all of our attention. All of that is, is determined and it is enacted by the prefrontal cortex. And a lot of our anxiety, and I talk about it a lot in the book, is learning how to redirect mm. your attentional network from those anxiety invoking things that you're not doing anything about. They just feel like these big fears that you're kind of obsessing over to other things. We talked about action that you can do to address fears, mm. to uh, other activities, to ways that you can use your creativity to get around those blockages that might be the focus of your fears. Does anxiety hijack the attention network? Is that what's happening or what's happening when, when we're overcome with anxiety? When we're overcome with anxiety, there is a high level of stress hormones in our system, which will tend to shut down the functioning of the prefrontal cortex, which is not good. You never want that because that helps you shift your attention where you need it. And also it helps you make decisions. Mm. Where does it go? Well, your brain's amygdala, mm. which is important and it's controlling your fear responses tend to take over. And what happens there is your habitual, your kind of reflex responses tend to take over. Not always the best response. Sometimes it will help in, in a real emergency if you have to run out of a burning building. But often what you really want in situations like that are non kind of bodily danger situations is a good prefrontal cortex mm. where you can use your focus, use your decision making skills at their height. And yes, too much anxiety is not good for that. 
But those of us with sort of generalized anxiety disorder, though, I think you said actually can perform pretty well with a lot of flooding. Or what did you write? You wrote a high cognitive load. How does that all factor in? Sure, sure. So high cognitive load doesn't mean that you have a form of anxiety. It just means that you're doing lots of different things. Got it. First, the studies where they they give subjects either a high cognitive load, lots of things you have to, you know, read a passage and do some math, mm-hmm. or a low cognitive load. There's just a simple picture to look at, something like that. That That's what it refers to. Got it. I got it. Okay. I found your writing on social anxiety and cultivating empathy fascinating. I've always seen people who I know with social anxiety and talk to and and felt that they have attunement that some other people don't. But how does cultivating empathy or even better compassion become a superpower for those of us with social anxiety? Yeah. So that superpower came directly from my own oldest form of anxiety that I've had for a very long time since I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. And that is a form of social anxiety. So Mm -hmm. of course, I'm a teacher and a speaker now, so I don't have the fear of speaking in front of audiences. But I was a very, very shy girl, you know, elementary school, high school, college, shy, awkward, social wallflower. Hmm. I especially remember many years of suffering in a classroom because I wanted to interact. I, I, I was always interested in, in studies, but I was scared to ask questions in front of the whole class because, uh, you know, the fear that the teacher would say, oh, <laughs> that's a stupid question, mm. be completely wrong or, or a terrible question. And so I had years and years of that. And I realized that years of, of dealing with that feeling came back to be one of my biggest empathy superpowers because now I'm at the front of the classroom. I'm a, I'm that scary teacher <laughs> <laughs> that people don't want to ask because they're afraid I'm going to say, oh, that was a stupid question. But of course, I won't do that. And I realized that, you know, from the very first day I stepped into the classroom, I always tried to make sure to answer questions, you know, before class, after class, if students didn't want to ask in front of everybody else that, that, that I was always there to try and answer questions because I knew what they felt like. Mm -hmm. It was Mm -hmm. my superpower of empathy. So I took that feeling and I just, I I projected and I can see them. I could see their their interest, but not asking questions and just hanging out, standing there. They're like, oh, actually, uh, Dr. Suzuki, could I ask you a question? It's, of course, love to answer your question. Mm. And so that's not just me. It's not just if you become a teacher. Mm -hmm. Everybody has that form of anxiety that they know deep down in their bones. They know what it feels like. They know what it looks like. And so your superpower is that you can turn that knowledge to the outside and you can recognize that in other people. And so your superpower will be to help somebody else out, whether you know them or not. Just a kind word at the right moment because you know what they're feeling like. That becomes your superpower of empathy arising from your particular form of anxiety. Thank you, Dr. Wendy Suzuki. Thank you. That's it for today. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Krinko. Many thanks to the LinkedIn Presents family and to all our guests for sharing their stories. If you love the show, tell your friends. I would love you to leave a review because they really matter in helping the show get found. You could also follow us or subscribe. If you have a question for me or you want to submit an idea for the show, find me on LinkedIn where you can follow me, message me, I promise I'll write back, or subscribe to my newsletter for more from the Anxious Achiever world. Thanks for listening.